Hi everybody, my name is Michael Desa, uh, and today we're going to, going to be going over InfluxDB 101. Uh, so a little bit more background on me before kind of I uh, dig into the agenda here. Uh, so I've been an engineer at Influx Data for about four years. So when Paul's talking about the history there, uh, right around the 0.8 to 0.9 transition is when I came on board. So kind of been through this whole story arc of the company. So if you have anything, any questions about anything the entire time, I'm happy to answer any question at all. And hopefully I'll be able to give you some kind of explanation. So the agenda for today is to uh, be able to just define at a high level what time series data is and kind of recognize some of its use cases. We're going to describe what the influx DB is and its relation to influx data. So there's been a little bit of a journey there. Uh, we're going to explain the influx DB data model, and then we're going to kind of reason about some of the impact that uh, schema decisions might have on our instance and things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about flux and influx QL and, and uh, capacitor and how we kind of got to each of these things. So, to get started, what is time series data? Uh, so it, it's kind of everything from tick market data. This is probably where I see people have the most experience with time series data. You know, just having the x-axis, you have time. Y-axis, you have the stock price, right? It's a great instance of time series data. We also have things like dashboarding and you know, uh, application monitoring, where we're looking at service latency and you know, the, the various kind of incidents, creation, and whatnot. All of this is kind of in the realm of time series data. It should be very familiar to everybody here, right? This is kind of what we're doing at a time series data conference. Uh, we also have things like system monitoring, right, where we're looking at the disk ops, the disk use, the short-term load on an instance, as well as the resident set size of a particular process, as well as IoT and things like heart rate data and how many of these slides did I end up making, uh, as well as kind of logs. And logs are an interesting thing that people usually don't really associate with time series, but if you think about the core, uh, it, a log really is a, a kind of event. It's, it's really a time series, right? So that's actually something that we've been focusing on here at Influx, is trying to figure out how do we get log data into our platform in a way that's reasonable. So we may not have the best kind of compression for strings, and we've been working on trying to make that something that's, that's more of a possibility. Something that people don't think of as much of when they think of time series data are traces, but, but really at its core, a trace is a time series. So if you're not familiar with traces or distributed tracing, essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to map uh, in, in kind of your system what took the most time in the relationships between those components. Uh, but the time component here really is how long something took, which doesn't necessarily fit with uh, a traditional kind of time series database, right? It's, it's not over time, it's a range of time. Uh, however, you can efficiently store these types of data into a time series database, and it's something that definitely uh, does work. Within time series, there's kind of two major categories. Uh, the formal terms for those are regular and irregular time series. So uh, regular time series is that graph up at the top. What you have is kind of a, a point coming in every fixed interval, so every five seconds, every 10 seconds, something that you know. So it's things like CPU monitoring, right? I pull the CPU at the same time every time just to get a general idea of the overarching shape. So that's called regular time series. And beneath that, we have irregular time series, which is the data is going to come in. We don't know when it's going to come in, but it's going to come in. Uh, both of these things are time series. The more kind of colloquial name for these is uh, metrics or events, right? You think about metrics, it's that regular time series data coming in at a fixed interval every 10 seconds, every five seconds, uh, as well as kind of events down below, which are, you know, somebody pings my server and I get a value back for the latency for that and I want to record that event, or uh, there's a security breach and I want to log that, right? So there's an event that takes place and we're trying to monitor those things. So, just so I'm not up here talking to myself the whole time. Uh, is this graph that we have here time series? We've got an x-axis temperature, y-axis price. Is this time series? Would anybody ever think that this is a time series? I see a lot of shaking heads. Anybody want to give a verbal answer? No. There we go. It's not time series. Definitely, definitely not time series. What about this one over here? Yes. Why? Yeah, exactly. So if we're, we look at what's going over here. It's the viral spread of Ed Sheeran Singh. Uh, and we're looking at that over time, right? We've we're got a visualization of the map, and we're looking at how its uh, kind of popularity has spread over time. 
the thing that is changing here is the time axis. Great. So what, what is a time series database? Uh, a time series database, in my mind, is really a database that has a few characteristics. Uh, my, my naive answer to this is it's a database where you manage and store time series data, but you can pretty much put any kind of uh, that data into any type of database, right? You can put in Mongo and SQL, really, really anything. But the two things that I think a time series database should kind of handle out of the box are should be able to efficiently handle time series data. So time series data traditionally comes in very, very high write loads. So you're monitoring hundreds of thousands, millions, or even billions of independent things. Uh, and then your query workloads are also kind of in that fashion where when you're reading data, you're reading millions and millions of records, right? You're not doing something where you're selecting a specific record. Uh, maybe you're doing your spec picking something that's like uh, the max record or something like that, but you're not looking for individual records in, in something. It's usually ranges of time uh, that you're looking for. And then the other thing that I think that basically a time series database must handle kind of out of the box to be considered a time series database is you need to support uh, range queries. So queries based off of time that are efficient. And I think it shouldn't be something that is kind of tacked onto the end. I think it should really be a first class part of a system. So uh, there's a bunch of different time series databases out there. Uh, we happen to be number one. Uh, it's a shameless plug here. Uh, that's why you're all here, I, I suppose. <clears throat> uh, but there's, there's been a bunch of them in the past. There's KDB, which is a multi-model one that's, that's very popular in the finance industry. Uh, and then in sort of the monitoring space, you have things like Graphite and Prometheus, RRD tool. Uh, and kind of new up-and-comers, you have things like, like Timescale. But, one question I get all of the time is, well, I know MySQL really well. Why, should, why can't I just use MySQL? Or I know Mongo super well. I can put my records in Mongo. And, and the answer is, you really can. But you're, you're kind of losing out on a bunch of things that a time series database just gives you for free. Uh, and it's only going to scale to a certain level. So you know, uh, day in and day out, we see people who are going from a graphite installation, which is a technical time series database, or MySQL or a Mongo solution to wanting something that is specific for time series. And that just has to do with the massive write load and the massive query loads that are associated with those things. And I think the more important factor in all of this is time series really is not just a database problem, right? So uh, if you've ever done anything with time series database, you, you really know putting your data into the database and just letting it sit there is not super useful, right? There's a lot of other components that are kind of intertwined with time series. So specifically, I think the big ones that come to me are I want to visualize my data somehow, right? I want to see what is actually happening and how it's changing over time so I can understand what is happening. I want to be able to alert on that data. So like if something's going over a threshold, I want to know about it. Or if you know, a particular value is an error or an error rate, I want to be alerted to that type of behavior. I also want to process that data. Like uh, I may not care about individual kind of points, but I want to see trends over, over uh, some kind of time scale. And then most importantly, I think I want to be able to take some kind of action uh, from my data. So, you know, what is InfluxDB and Influx Data? Something we talked about a little bit. It's a database, but how did we kind of get here? So, we didn't actually kind of fall into this time series database uh, idea or platform, time series platform kind of by random. It really started out in 2012 uh, when Paul and another founder uh, started a company called Airplane. And the objective there was to make something that was a lot like kind of New Relic and just make application monitoring a lot better. But pretty early on, uh, Paul recognized that there was a big gap in the market. There was other time series databases like OpenTSDB and whatnot, but they always had external dependencies. They were a giant pain to set up, or you could do something custom with Cassandra. And it was always very difficult to kind of get up and running. And so his idea was, let's just make a database that just does all of these things very simply. No external dependencies, uh, just let's, let's kind of get it up and running. Uh, around 2015 is when I joined the company, so, uh, and that's, that's kind of when we started the path of transitioning from InfluxDB to InfluxData, which is really a company that is all around this idea of solving the time series problem. So not just a database where you store the data, but also the visualization, also the alerting, also the processing of that data. Uh, and you know, from 2015 to 2018, we kind of were going down this path, and then 20. 
uh, yeah, 2018, we really kind of started hitting some rough edges with, with InfluxQL and the general model of things. It was setting up all, the, we built about four or five different pieces. We are, had something called the tick stack, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. But a problem we had is a lot of people didn't, uh, couldn't configure it very easily. And setting up all the pieces independently was, was a bit of a pain. And so there wasn't really a single unified experience of what influx DB was or influx data was. There were some people using capacitor. There were some people using chronograph or uh, Grafana. And there's all these kind of things. We wanted to really have a cohesive, singular experience that was the influx data experience. On top of that, something we had heard time and time again was uh, we're a team at a company, and we want to offer influx data as a like internal SaaS tool, essentially. Like we want to offer this as a tool to our internal teams, and we want a lot of tooling around controlling what series get written or who can do what in the system. And uh, we wanted to kind of build from first principles a system that would work in that kind of scenario. So. Uh, I think why influx data, why would you go with influx data or influx DB over some of the other solutions out there is I think to this day it is our, our kind of aim is it should be very easy to get started with. Right? We do everything that we can to try to get out of the way and help you solve your problem in, in however you see best fit. Uh, to my knowledge, we're the only company that is really aiming to solve the entire time series problem. We're not trying to solve the database part or the visualization part. We really want to get the whole solution right because that's what we think is the, the key to kind of uh, having time series be just a thing that is, is no longer an issue. And then on top of that, we, we scale well both horizontally and vertically. So uh, when I started, I would say our performance was OK. Uh, today, it's, it's great. So on a single instance, you can do a couple million writes a second uh, for, for time series data, which is, is pretty impressive. Uh, or if you want to use our commercial product, we kind of scale horizontally. So it's a lot about influx data. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the influx DB data model. But to do that, I'm going to kind of start with a canonical time series line graph and kind of reason about how I think about the various pieces of InfluxDB. So I, I always struggle to explain what's a measurement and a tag, and how are they different, and why would I put something where, and, and how should I think about these things. But whenever I come back to this graph, I find that I can kind of pretty easily reason about what those things are. So to start, we got a graph. It's stock price. On the x-axis is time. Y-axis, we have price. And then we have some kind of legend data over here. So. Uh, the first thing you should notice is that label up at the top. That label we call the measurement. So it's, it's a high level grouping for all the data beneath it. So common ideas for measurements are uh, memory or CPU or uh, Postgres. You just take a high level concept and you kind of group them into a, a thing. It's somewhat similar to a table name in MySQL, but I actually don't quite write, like that analogy. I think it's, it's a little bit more uh, a layer above that. Uh, next, we have the legend, right? And the legend is kind of metadata about what's going on here. Uh, we call these, these this met metadata tags. So for example, we have that blue circle there, right? That would be ticker equals A. And we'll say that the market would be NASDAQ, where the circle con corresponds to NASDAQ and the color corresponds to ticker, right? So uh, the collection of all of these things for a particular point, uh, we call the tag set. Uh, one important thing to note about tags is they're just key value pairs, something like that. Does adding it as a tag actually offer any kind of benefit? Is there really more than one point maybe associated with this, or is this just a way to get a single point? So the other thing that's super important to do is to not use too few tags. So something that can happen if you use too few tags is you end up getting data collisions. So uh, if I have the measurement C, uh, CPU with region US West and the host server one in a value of zero, uh, if I write all of this data down, what's going to happen is uh, you can kind of think of the ID for a, the timestamp as an ID for a point in a series. And if I write something that has the same measurement and tag set and the same timestamp, the fields that were there are going to be overwritten. And so you want to be careful that your data is sufficiently distinguished, because otherwise you're going to start getting collisions and you're going to lose data. And the system is a last right wins uh, system. So you know, if I wrote a bunch of things and I got a new one that comes in, same measurement, same tags, same timestamp, those fields will get overwritten. 
Uh, so that's something to be, be mindful of whenever you're, you're working with. So you want to make sure that you don't have too few tags. So now that I've told you what you should not do, the, the question really, what, well, what should I do? And I think that's a really hard question to answer, and I find it's best to kind of walk through an example uh, and, and kind of reason from first principles what may be the thing to do. So uh, whenever I'm designing a schema, I, I really start with the questions of, well, what dashboards do I need? What kind of things do I need to see? What kind of alerts do I need to have? Which one is like the mission critical things I need to be alerted on? And what kind of reports do I want to generate? Uh, and is there any information that I need kind of readily available if there's an incident? So uh, I'm trying to identify what are things that I'm going to be running continuously, like every five seconds on a dashboard somewhere, versus things that maybe be uh, a little bit higher latency or kind of random that I just need available uh, if there is a problem, but I don't need to have them offhand. So. Uh, we're going to walk through an example where we kind of reason about these things here. So suppose that I operate a SaaS application. There's hundreds or thousands of different services, and I want to know the requests and error rates for each service. Uh, and I want to trigger an alert if the error rate for each service is too particular high. And I want to see that the services, uh, I want to know which services currently have kind of the highest uh, average request duration. So I want to know what's really going on there. So that's the problem that I'm trying to solve. And at a high level, the data I have available to me is the application, the service name, uh, the container ID, the path, the HTTP request path, the method that I'm using, uh, the source and destination of the request, the status, HTTP status of the request, the request ID, the duration of the request, the bytes transmitted, and the bytes received. So this is kind of all the information I have available. There's potentially a lot more than this, but I didn't want to have this slide just kind of go on for forever where I just read the names of different possibilities of, of data. Although we can do that if you would like. Uh, so one question is, why would it be a bad idea to make container ID or request ID a tag? Uh, and, and one thing I want to stress here is container ID is not that bad. Uh, and I probably today would use container ID as a tag. But request ID is one I really want to call out here. So why, why would that be a bad idea? Cardinality, yeah, we're going to blow up the cardinality here. Uh, but as I said, yeah, container ID is something that we really, container ID is something that also kind of continuously goes up, especially if you're know, things like Kubernetes where containers coming up and down, right? So uh, they're very ephemeral and they will kind of grow unbounded. So you do want to have some kind of way to make sure that those values are being churned down. But it's something that is kind of common in the business and we've really uh, put a bunch of effort into allowing for that kind of churn in, in cardinality. So, so long as you have something cleaning up those series behind the scenes, your cardinality won't grow just for forever. But if you need to keep that data indefinitely, uh, having container ID is probably a bad idea. Right? Your, your series cardinality it will only increase. Uh, and so the next kind of question is, well, well, how should we organize our data? If we think about those original questions that we had, and the data available to us. Oh, there we go. Uh, we really wanted to know request rates, error rates, and uh, we want to be able to monitor and alert on those things, as well as kind of which things are taking the longest for us, which uh, request services. So the schema I would propose is we're going to have a single measurement. We're going to call that measurement latency, something like that. And then we're going to have tags for the application, so the service, the container ID, the path, the HTTP request path, the method, the source and the destination, uh, and then the HTTP status that we got out of that. And we're going to have fields for things like request ID, duration, bytes TX, bytes RX. This should be kind of pretty intuitive here, right? So none of the things that are tags are going to blow up on cardinality for us, except potentially that container ID, which could grow over time. Uh, and request ID we have access to if we need to. So if I wanted to look for a specific request ID, eventually I could do so and get the actual value back. It just might be a little bit slower. So it fits our category of uh, being able to get the data, but maybe not in the fastest fashion. Uh, and most of the visualization I'm going to want to do is probably based off of either the application or the container or some the path or something like that. So. Uh, and just to kind of give you an example, uh, here we have uh, the influx QL queries that we would issue to get those exact things. So we have something like select top average duration from app and 
uh, 10, so give us the top 10 average durations. Uh, and uh, to, we have a subquery where essentially we, we compute the mean duration as average duration for the latency for the last hour grouped into one minute intervals. Uh, and then we have the request rate and the error rate. One thing that's a little bit difficult to do here is uh, there's no way I could look at the uh, ratio of those things, which is what I would really want to do, but you can plot them on a graph and a lot of visualization tools will let you do that in the browser. But in InfluxQL, that was something that we struggled is how do we take these two pieces and kind of combine them into something that is coherent. Awesome. Uh, and I believe that is, is all the content that I have, uh, but I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions anybody has. Yeah, so uh, it's a little bit complicated to answer that question, but a retention policy, when the data is uh, retention applies to some data, that data will be evicted and the cardinality will come down. So the data gets de-indexed when uh, the data expires. No. So if it's two retention policies in the same database, it'll be the same cardinality. Yeah. Yep. What would you consider? What would you consider a high cardinality figure? Yeah, that's a great question. So it depends what you're using. So about six months to a year ago, we introduced something called TSI, which is a time series index, which is a disk-based index uh, that is kind of the default in 1.7. In that case, I would consider a high cardinality one billion series. Uh, we regularly test in the hundreds of millions of, of, of series, and that's kind of our, our aim rate, or like our target, but I've also seen workloads that do uh, uh, about the, the billion range that are, are possible. And that's our real target is to get into the super billion uh, uh, phase. So that's, that's kind of what we, we aim for. So if you imagine, you know, we have the sensorification of the world. There's going to be more and more things that are ephemeral, that are coming alive, that we want to be able to see that for like the series and track that thing over time but that thing's gonna change. So we wanna get that as high as possible. Uh, next question, yes. Uh, is there any way how can we me measure the size of inverse? Uh, so just to do stand, which test should I use? Or how, how are text, uh, 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 how are text, how are schema design is well done or not? How can we extend from that? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, is there a way that we can really systematically understand our schema decisions? Uh, there's a couple utilities that we have that will help you go about that. So you can look at a couple metrics that we have about the various sizes of things to get a feel for it. Uh, but the best way to do it is to give a schema a try. And then we have an explain query that will show you where a query is taking a really long time. And that's a pretty good indication of uh, where problem spots might be, but having something that's a utility that tells you this is the tag that is the problem and you should do these steps is something that we haven't got to, but we're, we really want to. It's, it's kind of on the agenda. Okay, yes? Uh, I've not worked with Flux yet, uh, so maybe this is a question I don't already know. Uh, is it possible to use Flux uh, within the database as triggers, like on insert? That's something that we're, we're working on in the immediate future. So it's not something that we have done yet, but if you remember from Paul's talk yesterday, he talked about trying to think of Influx data and InfluxDB 2.0 as really like a serverless platform for time series data and having specific triggers that will cause another Flux function to run or to pull in a certain set of data is something that we're working on. We do have tasks, which are that, but like on a cron job, but we want to have something that's more reactionary than that. So that's, it's definitely coming. And the question was, uh, what, uh, is there a way to have a, a flux function that's kind of run as a trigger to something? Forgot to repeat those. Yeah. How's it going? Anybody else? See everybody? Yeah. I'm wondering if it's really a good idea to store log messages in InfluxDB. Yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. Uh, and the, the objective, so there's been a couple other projects that have been doing something that is pretty similar. So Grafana has a thing called Loki that does uh, a pretty similar thing. And, and it's our opinion that really what you want to do is you want to grep through your logs. And if you can give us a time range 
and some things that you want, like a couple tags about possibly what you want to be looking at, we think you could probably pull log messages pretty efficiently after that. That being said, we do still have a lot of work to uh, be able to index a lot of those things efficiently and uh, to be able to store strings in a way that doesn't end up uh, blowing up memory. So that's, that's something that we're actively working on. But the dream is we really want to have a system where you can have logs, traces, metrics, everything kind of in, in one, uh, one area. So like the idea is, suppose I have a graph, right? And I see that the latency for my service spiked up a bunch. I want to be able to click on a specific metric there and then have the logs for that appear. And while you could hook into other systems, and we'll probably investigate if that's the thing that we want to do, our preliminary testing has shown that putting logs in InfluxDB, it works for our internal purposes. We do it internally. And so it's something we want to explore and, and definitely validate that if it, is po if it isn't possible, uh, what we should do about it. But so far, it seems like it's worked pretty well. Did I repeat the question on that one? I don't remember. It's so hard to remember to do that kind of thing. Any other questions? Going once. Going twice. I feel like somebody's dying to ask a question. All right, uh, that, that's my time. Thank you. <laughs>